My name is Nick. I'm from Auckland. Um, I work for Trimble. Technically, it used to be called Trimble Loadwright, um, doing dynamic weighing solutions for heavy machinery. That's about all I'm going to say about myself. Uh, is anyone here from Weta? Did we get anyone from Weta in the end? Oh, we did get a couple. Cool. I was going to make the talk like Hobbit themed, but then I didn't know how you guys would take that. So, <laughs> um, so you have to be with you. It's a bit dry. Uh, so basically, I'm here to talk to you today about standard variant, uh, specifically applying it to state machines to try and get more type safety um, out of them, and and basically turn try and turn I don't know, undefined behavior into runtime errors, runtime errors into compile time errors. Um, yeah. So this talk was originally based on uh, a talk by Ben Dean, and I think it was CppCon 2016. So I, I saw his talk, I think it was called Using Types Effectively, um, where he, he touched on standard variant using standard variant, but he talked more widely about just generally using types in C++ to get more type safety. Um, so I, I basically took the one nugget from that talk, which is standard variant in state machines, and tried to expand on that. I, I wrote a blog post on it and got a lot of feedback from people. Um, I, in my blog post, I compared Rust and C++, and I got some really good feedback about how to do this in C++, or how to do it in Rust better, and all this other sort of stuff. So I'm going to try and use some of that uh, in my talk. So just briefly before I start, does, does anyone already use standard variant? Is it, uh, oh, there's a couple of people. Cool. OK, has anyone used boost variant before? A few more people. OK, so hopefully some of this will be familiar to you then. Um, so to outline my, my talk as a whole, I'm going to start by introducing standard variant um, and going over how to use it. Um, so those of you who have used boost variant or standard variant before will recognize a lot of this. Um, once we've gone over the basic sort of usage, I'll look at a, a simple example of how to use variant and why we might use it and how it's useful. Uh, we'll look at a comparison with uh, boost variant, which standard variant is based on. So. Uh, Basically, boost variant was taken for standardization and made into standard variant. Uh, I'll also look at a comparison with standard any because people often kind of confuse standard any and standard variant. They kind of just sort of assume that they're, they're somewhat equivalent. They, they form, perform a similar function. They're both uh, kind of union, union types, but uh, how they function and the ways in which you can use them are slightly different. Um, and once I've gone through all of that stuff, I'm going to finish off by looking at how we can practically apply uh, all that we've learned about variant to uh, finite state machines, or state machines in general. Um, so, and I'll look at a couple of example implementations, which are uh, maybe slightly tautological, but um, they'll serve the purpose of allowing us to p compare performance, relative performance of those implementations, and uh, how we might better implement state machines using standard variant. So first of all, I want to start off with why should we care about C++ 17? I, I know from what I've seen online, at least, there's a lot of, uh, I guess not hate, but just general sort of, I don't know, indifference towards C++ 17. Uh, I mean, at least from what it seems like online. Um, I mean, is anyone here already using C++ 17 professionally? Professionally? Yeah. <laughs> OK, so not a lot of hands go up for that one. Um, is anyone planning on adopting C++ 17 professionally in the next year? A few, a few more hands. Okay, so, so the prognosis is fairly grim already for C++ 17, I have to say. Um, so a lot of the hate for online, at least, that I see is that people say that it's not substantial enough. Like, what's, what am I actually getting if I go through all the trouble of upgrading my compiler and, and integrating all this new stuff? Like, what am I actually getting for it? And, and a lot of the time, people will be like, oh, but it doesn't have ranges, modules, or concepts. So like, what's the point? Because those, those are the three headline features that were supposed to make it into C++ 17 and didn't. And I think concepts has already been uh, confirmed for C++ 21. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but in modules, maybe. I think modules are still in progress. So uh, we, we, these, even, these, even now, these features are still kind of up in the air. Um, but despite not having those features, C++ 17 still has some significant benefits that we should pay attention to, one of which is standard variant. Standard variant, standard any, standard optional, I, I call them like the holy trinity, if you like, they're three really great new utility libraries that, that are going to be introduced in, in C++ 17. You, you can kind of use a lot of their functionality from Boost, um, but for people who don't have ac access to Boost, C++ 17 will make it a lot easier. Um, there's also a lot of a range of other small like ergonomic improvements in C++ 17. So I think C++ 17 won't 
revolutionize the way that we program, but it will make a significant difference to our daily lives as C++ programmers. It will make things a little bit easier for us. Um, and why standard variants? And why did I choose standard variant as the focus of my talk? Basically, for me, standard variant is as significant to C++ 17 as standard unique pointer was to C++ 11. And that, that, that is quite a claim, but to me, that's how significant standard variant is. I think it will change the way that we think about type safety and programming with types in the same way that standard unique pointer changed how we think about memory, man memory management. So what is standard variant at a high level, 10,000 foot view? Um, online, it's, it goes by quite a few names. The concept, the high level concept goes by quite a few names. Tagged union is the most uh, searchable term, I think, at least from what I've seen. Um, so a lot of other languages have similar concepts to variant, uh, but they might just call them other things. But if you look for tagged union, you'll probably find it. Um, also type safe union or discriminated union. Uh, if you're looking for the implementation, then obviously standard variant is the thing to search for. The summary, though, is basically that standard variant is like a C union, but safer. So the increased safety basically comes through uh, type checking. So at, at compile time, we can ensure that only a limited set of types can go into a standard variant. At runtime, we can ensure that the type that's held by the variant at any one, at any given time is the type that we're interested in or the type that we want. So we can, we can make sure we don't access uh, an incorrect type or an invalid value or try and cast a type across a value across types or something like that. Um, and I think one thing that, uh, who was it? I think it was, I think Matt touched on yesterday was that Union, C unions have very poorly defined semantics in C++, so like um, move semantics, copy semantics, construction, destruction, things like that. It's all very ambiguous. There's a lot of corner cases and things that can trip you up with C unions. So standard variant kind of gets rid of all that and just makes it a nice sort of C++ object that handles everything nicely. Um, and the way it does this is basically bundling uh, a sort of normal type union type storage. So it has some storage for the types that you want to store in it, uh, which will be basically the size of the the largest type that it has to store. And then right next to that, it just slaps an index, which is basically just a, a counter which tells you which type is currently stored. Um, so the, the type, the size will be proportional to the largest type you want to store, but it will always be fixed at, at runtime. So like there's no runtime allocation, there's no overhead, uh, extra overhead at runtime. So given that we want to use standard variant, um, how do we go about that? So you need a C++ 17 uh, compliant compiler um, it doesn't sound like there's a lot of people uh, yet who are, who are on C++ 17 compatible compilers, apart from those developing them. Um, but even if you have a C++ 17 compatible compiler, at the moment there's none that ship with C++ 17 on by default, so you will have to pass a flag. Um, so that's basically GCC 7, I think I tested with 7.1. Um, Clang 4, I think I tested with up to 6. And uh, MSVC 15, which is Visual Studio 2017. Um, one note with Clang was that I think for Clang 4, even though it had support for standard variant, the minus standard equals C++ 17 flag didn't work. You had to use 1Z instead. Um, that's the only gotcha that I would outline. Uh, if you don't have access to a C++ 17 compiler, then don't fret. You can still get most of what I'm talking about, most of the advantages of standard variant by using boost variant instead. And boost variant is compatible back to C++ 98. So um, pretty much any compiler within the last 20 years, basically, will we'll probably, well, not 20 years, maybe a little bit less, 15 years, we'll be able to run this code. So, um, so that should be uh, accessible to most people. There's also other variant implementations. Some of them are based on the standard. Some of them are alternate implementations with other trade-offs. Um, but use and test them for yourself. Right, so let's look at some basic standard variant usage. How do we, what is, like, so we've, we've talked about the high level definition of what a standard variant is. What is it in terms of how we use it? Um, so a standard variant is just a template, just like any other STL library, I guess. It, it's a template which takes a variadic list of types. Um, so basically, you give it a, a list of types that you want it to store, and it will allocate store, enough storage to store uh, one of those types at a time, alternately. That's why these are called the alternative types. 
So in this case, I've declared a variant that can hold either an int, a float, or a string. So at any one time, it could hold an int value, a float value, or a string value. But it can't hold more than one of those at a time. So uh, by default, at the moment, it's default constructing. The variant on the first line is default constructing. So it, it will default construct to uh, an int, because int is the first type in the type list. So it'll be, I think, int zero uh, by default construction. On the next line, I just assign a value by the assignment operator. So assignment operators with variants work as you would expect. You can assign values uh, freely to a variant, and it just works. You don't have to do any sort of explicit casting or conversion. It's just assign a value, it in, in implicitly converts into the variant, um, or constructs into the variant. Um, as far as accessing the content inside the variant, so like once you've stored something in a variant, you want to get it out. Um, so the first thing I would probably suggest is that you want to check what's actually held inside the variant before you try and get it out. So you can check the type currently held using hold, standard holds alternative. So holds alternative is just a template to which you pass the type that you're interested in. So you basically ask, like, does the variant currently contain this type? And it will return true or false, basically, to tell you, yes, this contains a string, or no, it doesn't. Um, so in this case, I've said, does it hold a string? So the assert won't throw, so we're all good. Um, as far as actually get extracting the value out, the way to do that with standard variant is standard get and standard get if. So standard get is the throwing getter. If you want to get the content out and have it throw, throw an exception on failure, it throws a bad variant access, um, then standard get is, is what you want to use. So you pass it the type as a template parameter, and if the type matches, you'll get the value. If the type doesn't match, you'll get the exception. If you don't like exceptions, uh, or you can't deal with exceptions, um, then standard get if is the thing to use. Get if is slightly different to get in that you pass the variant to it by pointer. And uh, again, you pass the type as a template parameter, and it will basically either return you the a pointer to the value held internally by the variant. So it like, literally will return you a pointer to the memory inside the variant, but of the correct type. Or if the, if the type of the value held by the variant doesn't match the type you've asked for, it'll just return a null pointer. So you do have to do the null pointer check. That's the, that's the trade-off for not getting an exception. One thing I've also included on the slide here is indexed access. So you, you, I've shown how to access the type held by the variant, or the value held by the variant by the type, but you can also access it by index. So I talked in, about variant internally storing an index for which value is currently stored. So uh, storing a type index, which is related to which type is currently stored inside the variant. So you can basically use that type index to index the variant across the types that it can store. Um, and there's a dot index method on variant as well to tra basically translate a type into an index. So there's all kinds of uh, complicated stuff you can do with that. But um, I, I won't use indexing much in this presentation because uh, I, I don't need to. I prefer to use the type indexing. Uh, can I save it till the end of the section? I've got like, I'll have a bit, a bit at the end of this. So given that we've I've shown kind of generally, broadly, how to use standard variant. Let's look at an example to apply it, because I, I know everyone's probably still confused at this point, like, well, some people may be confused about why we would actually need variant. Um, so in order to motivate this, I've kind of created this value or error return type, and I did this before actually hearing uh, Jason's talk this morning about, uh, <laughs> in which he mentioned, what is it, standard expected? Um, so standard, this is basically standard expected. I've invented standard expected, um, more or less probably a worse one. Um, but I, I based it originally on, uh, I saw this in this same idiom in Rust as the result type. So they, they do the same thing, basically. They use the same, they use the same thing. They use a, um, a type safe union. Um, so basically the theory of it is that uh, I have a function and I want to return an error in some case. Um, so normally the way you would do this is either with an exception or you'd use a return code, maybe, maybe a Boolean return flag um, to indicate failure. Instead, what I want to do is basically have a function that can return either a valid value or an error. So I'm doing this by creating a variant which can hold either a type T or an error, which is the declaration for the result type there. So it's a variant type that can hold either a type that I'm interested in or an error value. The error value in this case is just a standard string. It's just an alias for a string. Um, and that's just to make this example simple. I, 
I tried something out as well with kind of abusing exceptions, like using an exception type with a unique pointer and all kinds of, no, it, it, yeah, I, this is simpler. This is, an error is a string. Let's just go with that. Um, so the way that I've used this type is I've created a function which counts up to 100. If it gets to more than 100, it throws an error. Um, it's a really tautological example, but it, it demonstrates the point. Basically, I've got some function that at some point may fail, but it's kind of a normal failure. It's not an exceptional failure where I want to abort the whole program or anything like that, or where I want to in incur a massive uh, overhead that like throwing an exception would. Um, so in this case, basically what I've done is I've got my result int type up front. Um, the function returns a result int, so I've used the template that I've declared. Um, so remember, that's basically just a variant. It could just be standard variant int comma error as well. Um, up to 100, it takes the integer. It, if it's less than 100, it increments it. Again, note that I don't have to convert the integer type or the string type to the variant type. It just implicitly sort of knows that that's a value that the variant will accept. If I tried to put a float value in there, it wouldn't compile, or it might do an implicit conversion, actually. Float value is probably a bad example. But if I tried to put a struct into that variant, it would go incompatible types, can't do this, there's no operator for this. Um, you get a compile time error. So um, that's, that's kind of nice. Um, so this is a little bit cruder than, than the, the Rust implementation, but only really because we're kind of limited to C++'s standard variant facilities. Um, although I will show something a little bit s very soon on how to make that a little bit nicer. Um, oops, wrong way. So how do we use the function, and what, is, what advantages does that provide? Um, so basically, I'm, I'm calling the function, and I'm assigning the return value to a result type variable, right? And then I have to unwrap the value. So this is the advantage of using this type as opposed to just using an error return code, is that if I was using an error return code, again, Jason mentioned something in his talk. He mentioned a decorator that you can use to ensure that a return, a return code or a Boolean return flag isn't ignored and get a compiler warning. Again, I didn't know about that in my defense. Uh, I wish I'd seen Jason's talk earlier. Um, anyway, so given that if, if we don't have either of those, then this makes it impossible to ignore the error. I can't just ignore the return code. I have to unwrap the returned value in order, to, in order to obtain something useful from it. If I was using a function that took a, um, an output parameter and returned a Boolean flag to indicate success, then I could happily use an invalid value um, in an, un, in an un, uninitialized piece of memory in my output parameter because, and just ignore the Boolean flag which returned false. And, and that, I see that pattern repeated commonly with, with this type of thing where an error flag is returned by a function, but people or programmers willingly or unwillingly ignore it and as a result process an invalid value. So this, this avoids that by making it a compile time error. Like you literally cannot use that result int as an int. It will not implicitly convert. So you cannot just use that as an int. You have to unwrap it and say, is this actually an int? So that's what I'm using standard holds alternative for here. I'm, Asking uh, if this holds an int. If it holds an int, then I get the int out. I assign it to the count and go to the next iteration of the loop. If it doesn't hold an int, then I assume that it's an error. It's the only other type in the uh, in the variant, so I assume that it's an error and I handle that um, and I handle that with a C out. Again, if the variant could hold something other than a T or an error, like if there was a third type, there was like a struct type or something, and it tried to execute this branch, it, well, it would try to execute this branch, but it would fail because it couldn't C out a struct or whatever or I assume it couldn't. If it, you could get subtle compile errors if it could, but in most cases you'll get a compile error. Uh, right, so hopefully that's kind of demonstrated one way in which we can kind of use the type safety of standard variant to improve, improve some parts of our programs. Um, but now I want to dive back into a little bit more detail about standard variant itself and what it is and how it works. So, um, just briefly on the types that it can and can't store, the types that it can store, uh, basically what you would expect, pretty much everything. Um, there are a few exceptions though. So if you need CRAs, I mean, most of these are just because the semantics around these types aren't well defined or they're not normal C uh, like C++ types and, and things like that. So it's, it's the things you would expect. Uh, CRAs, um, use standard array instead. Void, use standard monostate, which I'll talk about very shortly. Um, Reference types, which of course they're not really real values, they don't necessarily have storage, so use a pointer or a reference wrapper instead. 
if you want to store them inside a variant. Um, but the, those are the only real exceptions. The, the one thing that was surprising to me when I was going through the list of things that could go inside a variant was that unions could go inside a variant. I was like, what? Uh, it, it, you, it gets even deeper than that because you can go a variant inside a variant and you can go a union inside a variant and you can go like an array of unions and it, it, it was just like, whoa, whoa, okay. So it's not unreasonable what can't go in a variant. It's just, yeah, just be aware of those exceptions. Um, uh, another couple of things to be aware of with the types that can and can't go in standard variant. Um, CV qualifications matter. So you can have different CV qualifications of the same type repeated in the type list. So you can have like a, a type list, a, va a variant that stores an int, a constant, a volatile int, a const volatile int, and they're separate types. They'd be different type indices within the variant. Um, that might come in handy if you want to kind of handle those cases very specifically differently. Have you a constant versus int for some particular case, or if those types are alias, then it may come in handy, but um, yeah, I don't think it's going to change anything about the underlying storage um, uh, or the underlying sort of characteristics of the variant. The one thing it might change is the copy or move semantics. So variant to kind of get nice copy or move semantics as compared to C unions, it basically will implement uh, the common subset of semantics that the types that it can hold uh, implement. So if the types, all the types that um, the variant holds are copy, uh, copyable, then the variant itself is copyable because at any time you can guarantee that it's wholly a copyable type. So it's perfectly fine to copy that variant and its internal value around. Likewise, if you've got move semantics and all of the types held by a variant, then you can move the variant around happily. There's no problem with that. It gets kind of complicated if you have types that are alternately copyable or movable and that um, you may end up with a variant that's neither copyable nor movable, which is not very useful at all. <laughs> um, it, it, can it wait, like, just... I, I'm almost finished the section, and then we can, then we can do questions. Sort of, I think. Uh, okay, so standard monostate. I did just promise that I was going to talk about this very shortly. So standard monostate. One thing I didn't mention already was that uh, standard variant doesn't have a null state by default. So, like, uh, I, I did kind of mention it in the usage. I mentioned that uh, standard variant will default construct to the first type in the type list. So it doesn't default construct to an, an empty state or anything like that. It doesn't really have a real empty state by default. There is an exception to that, which I'll talk about soon. <laughs> um, but standard monostate is one way to get around that. So if you need an explicit null state, an empty state, then, s then use standard monostate. Put that as one of the types in your type list. The other reason to use standard monostate is to make a, a variant that isn't default constructible, default constructible. So I said that Standard variant will default construct to the first type in the type list. What do you do if the first type in your type list is not default constructible? Well, either you reorder your type list, if you can do that. If you can't reorder your type list, you put standard monostate front and center um, in your type list, and it will be default constructible to that null state. Why use standard, uh, why use standard monostate rather than your own uh, empty null struct? Basically because this is, this is for equivalence. This is equivalent across API boundaries, across programs. Um, across libraries, whatever. It, it, it is equivalent universally because uh, all operators are, are uh, defined for it and standard hash is defined for it in such a way that every single instance of standard, mo of standard monostate will be equal at runtime. There's, there's no difference between them. So they should always compare equal. So you can always go, is this a standard monostate? And it will be yes. Um, but that may not hold true for your own structs. So uh, I kind of told a little tattle uh, when I said that uh, when I said that standard variant didn't really have an null state because it does kind of have an null state, but it's not really a null state. It's it's an exception. It, it really is an exception. Um, so and it's triggered by an exception, funnily enough. So uh, this state is called valueless by exception, and it's basically where um, if you try and if you have a throwing is it copy move constructor uh, assignment operator anything like that if you try and uh, put a new value into standard variant and it fails, then at that point the content of your standard variant is undefined because you've overwritten the content, the old content of the standard variant, but you haven't finished constructing the new one, so uh, no one really knows what it contains. So at that point it's valueless by exception, and it has a method called valueless by exception which will return true if this is the case. At this point, standard variant is shot. It is, it, it's unusable because it, it basically if you try and access the content, it will return uh, variant impos, if you try and, or 
throw a bad variant access exception, um, or it'll return you a null pointer. It, the content, you cannot get it at that point. You, you can still resume using it. It will go back to a good state if you assign a value to it and stuff. It'll go back to being nice, but, um, but yeah, at this point, it's kind of blown up. It's, 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 it's in a bad place. So uh, this is something you want to avoid. You can avoid it by using, by using no throw, ironically. Um, put no throw on your, I think it's constructors, uh, and huh? no accept, sorry, no accept, not no throw. No accept. So put no accept on your, uh, on your constructors and assignment operators and all that sort of thing, and this goes away. It basically selects the right overloads and doesn't generate um, code, which leads to the state. Um, so that's the way to get around it. Uh, I will mention a little bit more about this later when I get to boost variant. So the next thing I want to talk about with uh, the, well, one of the last things I want to try and cover with standard variant and explaining what it is and how it works is the visitation API. So it does have a visitation API. I mentioned there was an easier way of getting the content. Um, so visitation API, the visitation API is my preferred way of demultiplexing the content within the standard variant, of figuring out what the type is and then acting based on what the currently held type of the content is. Um, so this works by basically taking the standard visit function, passing it a functor object, which is basically just a, a functor with a function operator overloads for each of the types that you're interested in. Um, to standard visit plus use plus, pass the visitor, uh, sorry, pass the variant, um, and it will basically call the correct overload for the content. So it, it basically, internally, standard visit is checking the type index of the variant, and then looking at the overloads and selecting the correct um, overload for that type index. Um, so there is some runtime cost to that in terms of uh, checking the type index. It, it's basically a switch, effectively. Um, but it's still, uh, I think overall it's nicer just because it gives you better encapsulation of, of that code for handling those different cases. One upside to using a functor object as opposed to using a lambda, which I'll talk about shortly, is that um, with a functor object, if you miss an overload, so if you don't have an overload for a type that your very, uh, sorry, yeah, the variant can hold, it will throw a compile time error. You have to handle all cases in your functor, or it will throw a compile time error. Uh, right, so the next one I'm gonna talk about is the same thing, but with generic lambdas. So C++ 17 uh, introduces const expra if, um, plus some magic around is same v, and uh, I think that's it. Yeah, so the generic lambda itself is from C++ 14. Is same v is from C++ 11, but it was modified in C++ 17 to sort of make some of this work. Um, and const expra if is C++ 17 only. So this, this only works in C++ 17. So if you go back to boost variant, you don't get this. You have to use a classic functor object. That's, that's it. So the nice thing about this is that you can kind of collapse multiple uh, blocks of the if else switch, I guess, into a single block if you want to using um, like const expra if ors and ands. Um, and you can kind of make the logic, like put the logic closer to where you're actually using the visitor or something like that, rather than having to declare a separate functor object. But it, I don't know. I feel like it's a pretty tenuous claim that this is better than using a, a classic functor object. I kind of prefer the functor just because it's a little bit, uh, I don't know, less dense, terse. Um, but I, I, yeah, personal preference, I think. Um, if I see some performance numbers on it, then I'll probably be convinced as to whether it's better or not. So applying that pattern to our value or error return type example that we had before, basically we have, uh, so that we have the same function, we get the result, we still put it into a variable um, of that result int type, but the way we demultiplex it is completely different. So instead of using uh, alternative, standard alternative two, I'm using standard visit, so I'm passing a lambda is the first argument, um, and the lambda does the type demultiplexing, and then the next argument all the way down the bottom is the variant. And then after that, I'm checking, I'm checking a condition based on this entire lambda. So the lambda actually is returning a Boolean value itself to control the loop. It's, it's, it's a bit mind blowing, but you can do this. So you can do this from within the visitor. You can actually return a value. So, so this is um, one thing that's great about standard visit is that you can return a value from the visitor um, and then standard visit will return that value. As long as the, the, the value matches, the type matches for all branches, for all, um, for all the variant alternative types, 
then it, it will basically return a single value of that type. So in here I'm returning a bool. And basically the visitor is returning uh, false if we should uh, keep looping and true if we should exit the loop. Um, so that's kind of a nice little, I guess, hacky way to use um, standard visit with generic lambdas. Um, so just going back to that, does, does anyone think that looks nicer than the alternative of like um, the previous one with just a normal functor object? So this compared to this. Who, who prefers generic lambdas? Wow, okay. <laughs> what an indictment. Okay, so um, moving on to boost variant. How much time have I got? About 30 minutes, right? Cool. Um, okay. We're almost done the section and then we'll do questions, I promise. <laughs> so like two more slides. Um, so boost variant. So as I've said a couple of times now, standard variant is based on boost variant. If uh, you don't have access to standard variant, boost variant is the next best thing. Um, however, there are a few differences to be aware of. So um, the main one is the never empty guarantee. So boost makes what is called the never empty guarantee. I use air quotes because that's, that's what they call it. Um, and that basically comes down to valueless by exception. So I mentioned that valueless by exception was kind of the, the wrinkle in the design of standard variant, and that's a compromise that they made in relation to the boost variant design because of, uh, basically because of performance reasons. So the never empty guarantee in uh, boost variant means that they handle that case where an exception is thrown during construction or assignment of a new value, by basically temporarily copying the value out of the um, variant into some temporary storage on the heap. So they allocate, every time you do a possibly throwing uh, assignment or uh, emplacement, they'll allocate some space on the heap, copy the internal value out of the variant onto the heap, um, do the assignment, and then basically destroy the value if it was successful. Or if it wasn't successful, copy it back in so the variant is in a well-defined state. So, this is a bit of a performance trade-off for boost variant that you have to be aware of. It's kind of a gotcha where it can kind of invisibly perform significantly worse if you don't, um, if you don't use uh, no accept, no, wait, no, no accept. <laughs> if you don't use no accept specifiers. So if you use no accept specifiers with boost with C++ 11 plus, it will actually recognize that and use the correct overloads, uh, use overload resolution to get the correct overload so it doesn't generate that code which um, allocates heat memory. So there is a, a way to get around that. Like I said, it's a bit of a gotcha you have to be uh, mindful of. Um, so that's the, the major difference between boost variant and standard variant. Um, the other, I guess one of the bigger differences is that um, boost variant has recursive functionality built into it. It kind of has this um, recursive, recursive variant and a, I think it's recursive visit function. Um, so you can inherently built in, it kind of has I guess facilities to make it easier for you to embed variants within variants and kind of just pass it one functor object which just processes the whole tree, the whole chain. Um, I haven't found a use case for that and I haven't used it at all, disclaimer, so, um, but I would love to hear afterwards if you have a, uh, a situation which you found that to be useful. Um, the other thing is just naming stuff. So like for instance, standard monostate is called boost blank. It, it's just really small differences between, uh, between the two. Last slide for this section is I want to compare uh, boost variant to standard any. So people usually conflate the two because they kind of are like, oh, well, they're both union types, right? Like, what's the difference? Um, so standard any, as opposed to standard variant, you don't have to name the types up front. So standard variant, the types that it can hold are encoded into its own type um, at, at compile time. Standard any can hold basically anything. It, it will just resolve that during compilation. It will figure out all the right overloads and and just do the work. The, the, the only gotcha is that those types must be copy constructible. You have to be able to copy content in and out of, um, in and out of standard any, whereas uh, standard variant will continue to work with movable types. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, so the way it does this, I, I mentioned that standard variant allocates storage statically, so it will just uh, allocate all its storage um, up front and it won't, it won't incur any runtime over here because of that. Standard any is different in that it will dynamically allocate storage to accommodate arbitrarily large types. Um, so there may be and in fact probably will be heap allocation if you're using standard any, uh, which is the downside. The caveat to that is that it does have a small object 
uh, optimization, just like SSO, just like small string optimization. Um, if you have an object that is the size of a pointer for libstandard C++, it will store that internally directly. Or if you're storing a pointer, it will just store it directly internally. It won't allocate another pointer on the heap and do all kinds of crazy redirection. Um, if uh, for libc++, on the other hand, for Clang, it, well, Clang's standard library, libc++, it's three times the size of a pointer. So that means that their any is a little bit larger by default, but it can also then internally store slightly larger objects. So you won't get heap allocation as often necessarily. Um, what else is there? Uh, I think I've covered everything pretty much. Oh, and it has an implicit empty state. So um, I mentioned that standard variant doesn't really have an implicit empty state. It doesn't default construct to empty. You have to use mono state if you want empty state. Standard any by default, it's empty. That's it. It has an empty state. Um, and in terms of usage, the usage is slightly different. So the semantics are the same. It's still like if you pass, if you try and get the value directly, then you'll get a, an exception if the value, if the type doesn't match. If you try and get the value by a pointer, then you'll get a null pointer if the type doesn't match. The difference is, is that um, standard any uses this any cast function, um, which kind of really confuses me because I don't know why they didn't just use standard get and get if. It just seems weird that they have literally the same semantics, but in this case they've used a single function and made it a, a cast function where get and get if work exactly the same way on a very similar type, but just a completely different naming thing. And they've used overload resolution here, so it can be kind of confusing because the semantics are subtly different depending on how you call this function. So that's, that's it for my overview of, uh, of standard variant and how it works and some basic usage. So hopefully that's given you an idea of what standard variant is. Are there any questions about that? I know there were a couple of questions, there were a couple of hands up, so there must be at least two. So the question was, what is the internal, like in-memory representation of standard variant? And I, I did mention that briefly. It, it's basically, um, it it's just like union in that it allocates enough storage for the largest thing that you want to store, um, and then additionally just slaps an index um, into that, that same object. So you're basically storing the size of the largest object that you need to store plus some size for, uh, I think it's, it would be like a 32-bit or 64-bit index. It depends on the implementation, so don't quote me on that. Um, plus maybe some alignment um, buffering as well. So, um, yeah, there is a little bit of memory overhead there, but not much. Yeah? Uh, with the get, why is there no sort of undefined behavior version of that when they have sort of an extra check to um, keep it in the same size for every one of those boundaries? Yeah. Sorry? So. Yeah, there's, so there's no way to, like, if you're really not concerned about undefined behavior, there is no way to invoke un undefined behavior and avoid all the runtime checking. That's true, and I have talked to people about that. I, I think there might be a way to hackily do it, but I don't think there's any way in the API that I'm aware of to just force cast, no? No, okay. As far as I know, there's, there's no way to force hacky cast the content of variant to a particular type. There might be a way to hack it, but um, it's not really supported by the type. Otherwise, you would just use a C union, I guess. <laughs> Sorry, the question was uh, the question was whether there's a way to like um, bypass the type checking and just get the type um, irrespective of undefined behavior. Yes. So the question was um, related to the result class and the fact that uh, Rust has a result class, Rust also has unwrapping and it has, uh, yeah, so that, that's basically the question. And yes, the answer is yes, Rust does have all those nice facilities, but Rust also has um, pattern matching. And pattern matching was originally part of the standard for standard variant. Um, it was in the original proposal. And I think if you watch, I think it was David Sankel's talk on standard variant, I have a link at the end of this presentation. Um, he talks a little bit about pattern matching with C++ with standard variant, but that didn't make it into the standard. I think it might be targeted for 21, but I'm not sure whether it 
there's been any movement on that yet. I guess, yeah, it, it, if you passed in a type, it, it should be possible to like unwrap or error. But it's basically standard get, right? Like you basically, standard get is, is an unwrap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Um, wow, okay. Uh, I guess I'll go Toby at the front. Sorry, I'm just trying to boil that question down to like something simpler that I can repeat. Um, so you're talking about, you're asking whether there's a way to use uh, to use templates with the um, with the visitation functionality, like. Um, so, so, so I've seen I've seen um, code that that puts in, that, uh, that allows you to uh, take a variadic, um, well, just some some lambdas and construct um, an overload fetch essentially, so it's so that you can provide a lambda for each alternative. Essentially. So the question was whether you can take a, a bunch of lambdas and basically combine them together to form a kind of super lambda that, that will resolve that type switching. The, um, the, the generic lambda stuff is about as close as you get, but it's more like a template class with specializations for each. And that's how you would do it if you were using templates. You would basically have a, a template class with specializations for each type. That's basically what the, um, the generic lambda case is doing. I don't know if there's a way to combine multiple independent lambdas together in such a way that at compile time that they would look like that. Oh, well, there we go. Jason said it's possible, so it must be possible. <laughs> I will take Jason's advice. Oh, okay, so apparently, inher inherit apparently via inheritance you can combine them together. Cool. Uh, yep, at the back. N yeah, that's that's one of the differences to union. I probably should have um, made clearer. So the question was, um, does variant act like a union? In the, in, uh, can you store uh, multiple values in it at once? And the question is, I uh, say so the answer is no. So it can only store one value at a time of, an, of a given type. You could store a struct with two two values in it um, alternately. So you could have a struct that's two ints, yep. and then another thing that's just a pointer, say. So you can ultimately store that struct or a pointer, but you can't do that directly. Like you can't say I want int int or float sort of thing. Uh, so yeah, yeah. You couldn't split the storage. Um, basically, not at least not directly invariant. You would have to, like I say, implement some other struct which does that kind of internally. Cool. Yeah. Sorry, for, for what? For SVN? For, yeah, for any, yeah. yeah so reserve or capacity functions that sort of reserve a certain amount of memory and then as soon as you reserve memory. So the question was for standard any, is there any way to reserve memory up front? And my answer would be I don't know. Uh, I would check the definition. Yeah. Okay. Yep, last. <laughs> Um, well, stood any. Sorry, the question was: Are there any reasonable use cases for um, standard any? And my answer would be that standard any will undoubtedly find usage because it's effectively the same as a void pointer, storing stuff behind a void pointer. So where standard variant is uh, sort of eats into the the domain of standard of C unions, standard any eats into the domain of void pointers storing ambiguous content behind on the heap behind a pointer sort of thing, you know. Um, so rather than storing stuff behind a void pointer, you would pass around a standard any, which is, equivalent, which is basically the equivalent. It's just that in some cases, you may not have to al actually allocate on the heap if the, if the any can actually store the value internally. Um, plus you get the type safety. Cool, all right. If there's no more pertinent questions, then we'll move up. Oh.
performance overhead I will get to shortly. Okay. Um, all right, so moving on to applications. So uh, to kind of motivate how we might use standard variant to implement state machines, I want to kind of show some competing implementations as well, plus an implementation using standard variant. Um, more generally about applications first, sorry. Um, so I've already kind of shown an application of using standard variant, obviously, for storing multiple types within a single value, so in this case a return value for our error, error or value return value. Um, but you can also do things like uh, heterogeneous containers, um, you can do uh, multi-value um, input parameters, things like that. Um, but finite state machines is the application that we're going to look at. And particularly, I'm going to focus on, uh, an, well, the example that I've used to motivate my code and kind of structure my code around is a, is a, st a state machine for an animation engine. Um, so my animation engine is extremely simple. Um, it's not very realistic in that you probably wouldn't use it in production, but it serves as a motivation for, uh, for the example code that I've created. So um, I've used the sprite sheet, which the attribution for which is, is here. Um, I use only one animation, the walking animation. I will quickly show you the finished state machine. So I can play, and it will basically play to the end and then stop at the end and return to the idle state. I can pause mid-animation and play and pause. And um, this is basically just testing all the state transitions. So this, this example was kind of demonstrative for me just to kind of figure out that I got all the logic right and to, to I don't know, have something to show for it. It's just kind of cool. Um, and I can also go back to the stop state. So going back to the animation engine itself, the state machine that I'm using to motivate these examples. Um, Mm. Yes. All right. So the state machine is a simple three-state state machine. Um, the three states are basically idle, animating, or paused. Um, idle is basically just stopped. Animating is playing. Paused is paused, um, to use some different language. In the idle state, the frame counter is basically zero. It's always zero. It never changes. It, it just it's stopped at the first frame. In animating, basically every time we get an update, we're updating the frame counter. Um, other than that, we're still returning like the current frame counter. In the pause state, we have a frame counter that's not zero. It's some other value, but we're not incrementing it. I could have got away with just two states for this example. I could have just had playing and paused, or playing and stopped, or something like that, or even just one state. I don't know, just always animating, but. For this example, I kind of wanted to have three states to try and show some of the more complex patterns that you can implement with standard variant for state machines. Also, I kind of wanted to have this transition where um, most of the states you can transition to and from freely, but uh, you can't transition from idle to pause. So you can't go from stop to pause. Um, and that's, again, to kind of have something, I guess, to, to use to show the type safety and how we can like prohibit, um, prohibit disallowed transitions, for instance. Um, so there's three, only three inputs to this, which is basically play, pause, and stop. There's also a bunch of update functions and other internal logic. But um, for the most part, the events are play, pause, or stop, which causes these transitions. And we can also stay in the same transition. So we can um, loop basically within the transition, repeat the transition more than once um, in sequence. So the first implementation I want to show is the naive implementation. So who here recognizes this, this code or has written this code or has reviewed something like this? A few people? Yeah, OK, a few, quite a few people, right. It, it, it's pretty common to see this around, even if you don't write it yourself. Um, this is kind of the implementation like that they seem to teach at universities. I don't know. It, it, it's, um, it, it's very common even for programmers who don't know anything about state machines to fall into this pattern. They'll use an, an enum, enum to, you'll see things that look like state machines because they look like this, but the program is just programmed it the way, that way because it, it, they fell into that pattern. It's the pattern of least resistance. Um, so it's a well-known pattern. Everybody knows how to do it. Um, and it's easy to optimize, and it's easy to expose the state. The downsides are also the simplicity. So it, it, Everything is kind of bundled in together, so all of our state data is active all of the time, all of our state properties. 
So if we have a property which is invalid in certain states, then in those states it's still accessible, it still has a value, um, and if we try and access it, who knows what that'll do, like whether we'll get an invalid value, whether it just won't work, whether we get a valid value but in the wrong state, so what does that mean? Does this value mean anything in that state? There's lots of questions. So um, that's one problem with, with having everything bundled into the same state. The other problem is, I guess, the memory footprint, but that's probably less of a concern for most people, um, most people here. Uh, the next implementation I want to look at is a polymorphic implementation. So uh, when I was trying to look for implementations for this presentation, I kind of just Googled finite state machine implementation C++. And the two implementations that came up most often were the naive implementation and this one, which is basically people using polymorphism, class inheritance, yeah, it's terrible. Um, to implement state machines, and I was like, oh God, no. Um, but nonetheless, I've included it for completeness. Um, so at the high level, we have a, a state class, a state superclass, effectively, which defines the interface for all the individual state classes. Um, so you can see all the events there. Um, any common members between all of the states could be defined here as well, so they can be inherited um, by all of the state classes. Uh, but yeah, it, it's really up to you on, on how far you go on this one. Um, the, the downside to the polymorphic approach is that because we're using polymorphism, we basically have to allocate these nodes on the heap. It gets really complicated if we want to try and allocate them on the stack and return a pointer to them because we have to like pre-allocate and yeah, it, it, it doesn't work. So basically we, we have to use heap allocation and because we have to use heap allocation, I'm using unique pointer because I never use heap allocation without unique pointer now. Um, so I'm moving unique pointers around basically to manage the memory here. So I'm trying to, trying, really trying to reduce the, the overhead of this, but it, it's kind of in vain, I guess. Um, so for each class, uh, so for each state, we have a separate state class. So we're able to split the state properties and the state logic out into completely separate classes, which gives us really nice separation of state from like an OO perspective. And I think this is why a lot, like, a lot of people choose it and like, a, like some schools seem to teach it is because it gives, it's like really nice from an OO perspective, like those Java classes just love this stuff, like they just lap it up. Um, and it also means we can separate out the members, the data members, so we can't access members which might be invalid. Can I, yeah. I'll do another stop at the end of the section, which is, this is a lot shorter than the previous section, so don't worry. Um, sorry, so yeah, so we can separate out the data members so we can make sure that we can't access data members from states in which they are invalid. So that's a pro. Um, finally, we sort of kind of bundle all of those state classes together and the state interface and tie it together with a whole lot of transition logic. So in this case, I'm delegating all of the transition logic to uh, all of the event logic to the uh, state subclasses. So each of the state subclasses implements a method for say play and stop and pause um, and handles that, that logic internally. So that's really nice. So all I have, uh, all I have at the top level here is basically a, okay, go handle the state transition and update the state if it changes. Um, and I, the only reason I have this little update state method is basically to make sure that I'm not um, allocating new state objects unless I need to, unless the state changes. Um, so as I said, this, the big advantage of this method over the previous one is that we get better separation of state, even better separation of state mechanics. We can basically separate out all the transitions into separate classes. It's all really nicely object orientated, encapsulated, separated. The disadvantage, as most of you probably will have guessed, is a huge amount of overhead. So this is not only, not only runtime overhead, but also like just the code. Like it's taken me three slides to explain this, um, this implementation. And that's, and that's cutting code out, like I've snipped all of the implementation out of these, of these classes and these functions. And it's still taken three slides to explain. So hopefully that indicates how verbose it is. But the runtime overhead cannot be overstated. It is massive. You have dynamic allocation plus virtual classes, virtual, uh, virtual method chasing. It's the worst of both worlds in terms of C++ performance. Am I going for time? <laughs> okay. Um, da, da, da. 
All right, so moving on to standard variant. How do we implement a state machine using standard variant? This implementation has some things in common with the polymorphism approach in that we can separate out the uh, state properties into separate classes. I could have separated out the state logic as well, the transition methods and things like that, but uh, I don't know, reasons? Uh, verbosity and yeah, I've, there was a lot of, there would have been a lot of delegation for not a lot of extra um, advantage in this case, but I will explain a little bit later how I could have obtained some more advantage by separating out state more. Anyway, in this case, it's a really brief implementation, one slide, that's all the code you need to know. I did snip out a little bit, as with the other implementations. Um, so I'm just showing one transition method here, and I'm using the standard visit pattern with the generic visitor, which we've already covered um, in our introduction to standard variant. So um, the good thing about this is that we get um, type safety. So the type safety that we get is basically the incoming transition to, uh, to any event, to any state transition. We can ensure that this, the current state that we're in is definitely that state because the standard variant tells us that it's definitely holding that type. We're definitely demultiplexing the correct type. So um, for instance, on the, on the right here, you can see the, the visitor. Um, I've got an operator, uh, function call operator defined for each incoming state. So for each state, I have a set defined um, logic of what happens next, what the next uh, thing to do is. Um, likewise for the generic visitor, a uh, generic lambda visitor, but it's a little bit more complex, a little bit more terse, and I was able to com basically combine uh, some cases. I think I combined possibly, yeah, I combined the idle and pause states, I think. No, sorry, I combined the, oh, nothing happens in the animating state because uh, there's no state transition. I believe. Yeah, so this is from the animating state, that's what it is. Um, so I think I mentioned this before, the generic lambda approach does allow me to some, in some cases be a bit more brief, but I get more type safety from using a, a full visitor object. So that's just um, incoming type uh, safety. How do I get more type safety in terms of the, the next state that I'm transitioning to? How do I ensure that that's not outside of some, uh, some legal range? Um, so the way that I do that is I have to kind of, I actually have to use another variant. Um, so I've split out the state logic in this case to another method which handles, actually handles the event and that function is basically switching on, a, uh, on the incoming standard variant, um, demultiplexing the type and then returning the new state. The new state is going into a new variant which is either, uh, that variant contains either the new state or standard mono state if no state transition occurred. I could have had uh, a variant which held standard mono state or another standard variant with a list of states, but in this case it's only one state, so I've just put it directly as it's either mono state or it's the new state. Um, so that allows us to then check back in the play method, did we, did we get a, a new state? If we didn't get a new state, then we don't assign it. So this, this type signature here for the event play function is enforcing that we can only return state animating or standard mono state. So we can either have no state transition or we can return animating. If we tried to return state play from here, that would be, that would be sorry, if we stayed, tried to return state idle from here, that would be invalid. We would get a compile time error. So that's how this gives us more uh, compile time assurance, more type, type safety um, around our state transition logic inside our state machine. So, um, hopefully now I've convinced you that uh, using uh, finite state machine, sorry, using standard variant we can get more type safety in our state machine so we can ensure the incoming state and the outgoing state using the type system um, so we can basically make sure that we get either compile or runtime errors um, in all the cases where we've written incorrect logic for our state machine given that we've specified it as part of the type system. So, that's, that's the key advantage of standard variant is basically the, um, well, that it gives us some separation of state and allows us to get that increased type safety on the interfaces of the transitions. I will talk about the overhead a little bit more shortly. Um, in terms of disadvantages, the only real disadvantages are um, the complexity. So it was very verbose, especially if I wanted to try and get that extra type safety. I really had to 
work for it. I had to do a lot more uh, code. My implementation got significantly more verbose. So when I talk about the size of the implementation for standard variant, I'm talking about the original implementation, which was tiny. Um, if, I'd wanted, if I wanted to get all the type safeties, then I needed a much bigger implementation. Um, and so I do have to kind of pay for it a little bit. Um, longer compile times, it is a template. You are going to pay for that. Uh, C++ 17, it is required unless you use boost variant. So like I said, you can get most of this out of boost variant um, and using classic visitors and things like that. It's more verbose, but you can still get it. Uh, so I think that's the end of, oh wait, not quite, one last one. Okay, so I did actually <laughs> include the, uh, the implementation for boost variant. So um, if you are stuck on C++03, it is still possible to do pretty much all of what I've shown with standard variant with boost variant. Um, the difference is that you have to use boost and that it's more verbose. So here I'm using, a, a uh, functor object rather than a uh, generic lambda. Um, I have to have the type def, um, type def declaration inside my visitor as part of boost, boost visit. Um, I have to have constructors on my, uh, on my state objects because of, I think it's initialization syntax generic, uh, I can't remember what it is, something about C++11. Um, so it, the whole implementation kind of expands out a bit more and becomes a bit more, bit more verbose, but in terms of capabilities, it's basically equivalent. And the next section, I will try and back up this with some data. Um, and actually, rather than making spurious claims about performance and, and uh, since we're at a C++ conference, that's what we really want to know about, um, I will attempt to actually back it up with some numbers. In the meantime, are there any questions about the implementations that I've shown um, or about implementing state machines with variant in general. Yeah. Well, just with the alternative for state machines, instead of using actual classes for everything, you could probably use a string function instead, and then capture it in, or you'd find the instance of function to do it with the state machine. So the, yeah, so that was a, the question was, could you use standard function and pass in ob objects, pass in lambdas? Using the standard function instead of the Oh yeah, so use standard function instead of the state classes. You could do that, uh, and I guess you could use a lambda capture to capture the state for each, but then you wouldn't get the state separation, I think, unless you copy, I guess you could capture by copy. Uh, it may be possible, I haven't, sorry, I haven't tested it in this implementation, so, but by all means, feel free. Yeah, so the comment was that um, you could possibly also implement something similar using coroutines, and I think Toby did touch on that yesterday, that um, it might be possible to implement state machines using coroutines. Um, but again, I haven't tested that in my uh, presentation. Is there any, uh, yep. Right. So the um, comment was that the um, pattern with using separate classes for um, each state is proposed in the ga uh, Gang of Four book, which is originally where that, that design's come from, right? So that's why it's seen everywhere. <laughs> it's why it's so ubiquitous. Is that? Yeah. Cool. And someone just do it plain with it, like, like if you want um, uh, behavior on inheritance, or like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that actually is worth paying for. Uh -huh. So the comment was that um, sometimes it's worth paying for the uh, for virtual classes and inheritance. Um, if you if you want to make use of inheritance specifically, um, not specifically polymorphism, but I guess the argument to that would be that you could possibly use compile time um, like templates polymorphism to do that instead. Um, and I that's one implementation that unfortunately I didn't I didn't show on here, but I only really sort of clicked about using that implementation when I saw um, I think Carl's presentation just before mine, uh, where he kind of touched on those kind of implementations, and that, that would have been a good one to show as well, but um, yeah. Any other questions or comments?
so uh, uh, the comment uh, was. Okay. So the comment. So the comment was just around the efficiency of my polymorphism implementation, um, and that it could be vastly improved. And I did mention that it would be possible to, instead of allocating the classes on the heap, if you want to use polymorphism, you could pre-allocate, you're correct, you could pre-allocate instances, say in the base class, one of every state, and then basically switch between them, um, pointing between them. So instead of having to allocate on the heap, that would save some overhead. Um, there are definitely ways to make my, any of my implementations more efficient and to optimize them more. I've kind of provided them as uh, a straw man as something to sort of start with. Yeah, so the, the comment was that there's no way to eliminate the uh, virtual the method calls, dispatch. the runtime dispatching. Okay. I think, I think the comment, I think the comment is about the runtime dispatch of standard variant itself. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. So the argument was that um, possibly uh, that uh, standard visit would not be any faster because it still has to dynamically determine the content ID, the type ID that it wouldn't be any faster than uh, virtual method calls. I will try and provide some data which may, which may refute that, but then I, I do, it is conflating it with the um, heap allocation as well, so my data is certainly not definitive. I would certainly suggest that you, you go away and test that um, if, I, if my data isn't satisfactory. Any other questions? No? Okay, well let's get into the benchmarks then. Um, I just want to give, so, no, no more? Okay. Um, I just want to give, uh, first of all, some caveats. So, um, as I've said, my implementations are very specific. They're straw man implementations. They're not real world implementations. Um, so, certainly take these results with a grain of salt. But I want to provide some general, overall comparative stats for implementations, maybe not absolute performance numbers. Um, and also, this isn't really about the absolute performance either in that it's more about the optimizability of each implementation, how easily the compiler can see through the implementation and um, compile it away. Um, because ideally that's what we want our compilers to do is, is make the implementations disappear completely. Um, that's where we get the fastest code. Um, so all the tests are run on my laptop, uh, powerful Core i5, uh, running at 1.7 gigahertz. I fixed all the cores so there was no turbo boost, no um, funny stuff, uh, but um, by all means, if you're not happy with the results, then I um, fully suggest that you um, go away and test for yourself. I will provide uh, a link to the code at the end of this presentation. So the first chart I want to show is um, using GCC 7 at 02. Um, I basically created a bunch of benchmarks using my simple state machine, just basically pushing it through a few states um, and then testing the time and then having Google Benchmark um, basically run that through a bunch of iterations and give me the time. So um, what I found was probably uh, not terribly surprising uh, in that um, for most of the benchmarks, the virtual class implementation is horribly slow. Um, it vastly slower than the other implementations. So that may be due to the heap, heap allocation. It may be due to the virtual pointers. It may just be due to my implementation being extremely poor. But in this case, it seems to be far and away the worst in a lot of the cases. The compiler really had trouble optimizing it compared to the other implementations and all these benchmarks. So these other benchmarks, all the other implementations were almost optimized out. They, they're down to less than 50 nanoseconds. And in the case of the naive approach, it's pretty much optimized down to two nanoseconds in just about every case. Um, and I found it very hard to not get to, for the, to make the compiler not, op, not optimize the um, naive implementation down to that point. It was very good at optimizing the naive implementation. Um, the only benchmark then that's really left that's really interesting is the play until stop benchmark, which is basically just iterating through um, the sequence of frames until we get back to the stop, stop state, um, which isn't the most strenuous of benchmark, but it seemed to be the only one where I got results that were at all close in terms of, I mean, there's only a maybe 100, millisecond, 100 nanosecond Sorry, 100 nanosecond per iteration spread between 
um, between the implementations there. Um, but if we turn up the optimization level, then that kind of disappears. Um, and again, the naive approach comes out vastly superior. Um, so in this case, like I said, naive approach almost getting optimized away completely. By comparison, um, virtual classes have actually regressed. So again, I can't attribute why, but um, clearly the increased inlining, the, the aggr more aggressive optimizations, uh, maybe loop unrolling or something like that has caused that, that particular implementation to, um, to actually take longer to execute. Um, standard variant and boost variant haven't really changed much, only the, uh, the gap between them has changed, so they're still uh, relatively good performers compared to the virtual class implementation, but still far behind the naive implementation. Um, sorry? Yeah, it's okay. Um, I'll get through it. So this may be probably one of the more contentious uh, controversial, I'll say, slides that I'll present. Um, how many people in the room use uh, MSVC? All right, and everyone else I assume is using GCC? Is it, yeah, GCC? Pretty much, yeah, okay. <laughs> everyone in this half of the room, and this half of it, no. Um, so what I found with um, testing on Windows was basically, I want you to just completely disregard the, the absolute differences between the graphs. Don't, don't look at this as a Windows Linux debate, it's not. Um, all that this shows is that the decision for which implementation, if you're making a decision based purely on speed or based largely on speed uh, or optimizability of the implementation, that decision will not change depending on whether you're using MSVC on Windows or GCC on Linux. Um, for either of those compilers or platforms, the implementations seem to perform relatively the same. Um, the one thing that's missing from this slide is results for Clang, and I do apologize for that, Chandler, wherever he is. Somewhere, over there, yeah, in the corner. Um, I do apologize for that. I did try frantically to compile uh, Clang last night after his talk, and uh, <laughs> unfortunately I still couldn't get it to work, so uh, I do apologize for that, I tried. Um, finally, the, I guess the, the silliest graphs that I'll show, uh, uh, compilation time and line count. So compilation time, the times are so small because implementations are so small as to be barely significant. So um, I've shown this purely because it reinforces what we would expect anyway, that templates take longer to compile. Um, so the, the nature of both boost variant and um, standard variant being templates means that you will probably incur some compile time cost from that. Boost variant incurs more of a cost because in this case I'm, I'm compiling with C++03 only on, not C++11 or 17. So it's not using variadic templates, for instance, um, which provides some, some speed up. Um, in terms of the line count, basically the implementation was just divided into verbose implementations and not verbose implementations, brief implementations. Um, as I said with the standard variant approach, it's kind of, uh, a misnomer to, to judge it purely based on these numbers because I could have added more verbosity in order to get more type safety. Um, so there is a trade-off there. Um, and of course, verbosity more generally in C++ basically means that you're specifying your program more uh, accurately to the compiler. So overall performance conclusions, um, as I said, take these results with a grain of salt. Um, don't trust my numbers. Clearly uh, there are people who will have other uh, concerns about them. Um, but I really encourage you to take my code and, and modify it, improve it, test it. Um, certainly um, compare the implementations if you're going to have to make this decision on your own, uh, for your own code base. Um, clearly the naive approach is the best if you're already looking at high performance. If you're doing high performance, then chances are you're using some hand-tuned ASM sort of monster anyway, or just some weird random thing that's been hand-tuned, so um, what you're doing is probably already working for you and I'm not gonna convince you otherwise, which is fine. Um, but if you're using polymorphism-based state machine, uh, hopefully not. Um, if anyone's using polymorphism-based state machines, uh, I strongly suggest that you look at variant instead as an alternative because um, clearly anything's better than, uh, than the implementation that I've shown for uh, polymorphism. Um, and I think you can actually tweak more, uh, I think you can actually tweak get a nice implementation 
and get more speed for uh, a neater implementation out of um, standard variant. And if you're still stuck on C++03, don't fret. Boost Variant's here to help. You can still get all of these advantages um, through Boost Variant. So overall conclusions, as I said, naive implementation, if you really only care about performance, I'm not gonna change your mind on that. Um, but otherwise, standard variant offers decent performance, um, good separation of state, and way more type safety, um, especially if you're willing to invest the time in the implementation. So should you use standard variant for your own FSMs? Uh, I'm not gonna tell you. Uh, test it for yourself. Um, do your own benchmarks. And that's pretty much it. So um, <laughs> uh, that's actually the end of my talk. So I've got some references here. I highly suggest you have a look at some of these links. Um, otherwise, that's me. Thanks for listening. <laughs>